Good. Let's dive back into transformational theology, please. So here's the story. About 10 years ago, more or less, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I did a, a BHL in Delhi. And at that point, we had been working in India for a number of years, basically in the leader development area, working with church planting networks. And so our team decided to do a, a big training in Delhi. We invited more than 100. Uh, it was uh, almost entirely top leaders of uh, large church planting networks from around the country. So I did a BHL, basic BHL. It went really well. Uh, out of that came a number of ongoing relationships with church planning networks. But there was one group in particular that, uh, with whom we connected very, very deeply. And I remember, I still remember, they were sitting there, you know, as I'm in front of the group, and, and there's a table right there. And there were about five of them. And they're from a ministry called NIEA, New India Evangelistic Association. And uh, Dr. Alex Phillip, uh, the top leader of NIEA, his father began the ministry many years before. They work in four areas, Bible translation. Uh, they uh, have translated dozens of Bibles. Last I heard, they were into the 60s, uh, you know, 60-some languages of brand new translation work. This is a big ministry. Uh, the second thing is medical. Uh, they have a hospital up in Bihar and do a lot of clinics, uh, that sort of thing. Thirdly is church planting ministry. Fourthly is training ministry, leader development. Under the training, they do both formal and non-formal. So they have a uh, seminary called New India Bible School. Bible Seminary. Okay, New India Bible Seminary. So NIBS. NIBS is the seminary. NIEA is the, uh, the big... Thanks, bro. NIEA is the, like the big organization that has these four big arms. NIBS is their seminary. So Dr. Alex Phillip came. Uh, who became very, very dear friends uh, to me personally, to Robert, to all of us, to Jebba, of course, uh, to all of us, became a very, uh, one of our closest, really, relationships in India. And uh, also there was uh, an amazing woman of God by the name of Jessie, Dr. Jessie Thomas, Jessie Jason. Uh, her husband is Jason, so it's Jason and Jessie, easy to remember. And uh, both of them are the, uh, Jason, I think, is the principal of the seminary. Uh, Jesse works with him very closely in that. Both of them, seriously brilliant. Scholars. These are scholars. Uh, uh, Jesse has written a number of books. Uh, I've got several of her books. Uh, actually, in some of her most recent books, she used a lot of our stuff in them. And so she would give me a copy and I'd look at it and think, oh my goodness, I can't even understand uh, this would take a lot of work just to read. I mean, it's really scholarly, heavy. You know, she's really brilliant, but very uh, wonderful, both Jason and Jesse. Deep lives in God, uh, high integrity, uh, just really uh, precious, dear friends. So uh, Jason was somewhere else, but Jesse was there. And then there were several board members from the organization. So we went through uh, the BHL and they were just so responsive. They're participating, interacting on the breaks. They want to talk to me. At the end of it, they came and they said, this is what we have been looking for. They understood what it was, you know, the 5C4D model, not just some nice little cute kind of little thing. They, they saw the meaning of it, the power of it. They said, we have been trying to develop our own model We've been trying to figure out how do you frame life transformation, especially in a uh, theological education context. How do you frame that in a clear, systematic, structured way? Uh, they said, we're heading in exactly this direction. Uh, you're just years down the road from where we are. Can we start working together? Uh, as I said this morning, previous to that, it never occurred to me that we would end up working with seminaries. I was just very happy working with church planting networks. Um, and so, of course, I said, we'd love to. That would be a great privilege. I had previously met Alex, uh, but we, we hadn't really... Uh, he, he, he actually, he came to one of the LDCs. 
uh, uh, one of the ones in Hong Kong. Um, and I, I'd met him also in conjunction with the, uh, what is it, the fourth, uh, the, um, the uh, 414, 414 the, the, uh, the children, you know, the 414, yeah. Yeah, the 414 window, yeah. I'd met him through that. Um, so, but we became very close, uh, began to work very closely together. And um, please, uh, Robert was involved in this, Mary was involved in this. So if, if I forget little bits or if you want to add something, please just pop up in the context. As I'm, I'm just going to quickly tell the story of how it happened. Uh, it was quite fascinating. So first of all, uh, I think I was the first to go, actually go out there. They're based down in Kerala, southwestern India. Uh, this is one of the Bible belts in India. Um, many, many <coughs> seminaries, institutions there. Um, and, and origins of missions, orgs, and so forth are there. And so first we did some work with the board. Now, this was all uh, designed and directed by Alex Phillip, the top leader. Really, uh, he's a superb strategist. So this was his strategy. He laid it out. Why don't we do this? Well, sounds great to me. And so we began with the board. Uh, and it's an example uh, of how the top leader is so critical to this happening. You can have a few people, you know, faculty, for example, on the staff of a seminary uh, who may want to go in a more transformational direction. But if you don't have the top leaders, nothing's going to happen. Now, we had the top leader of the entire ministry was absolutely committed to this and remains committed to this. I remember in the early days, Alex uh, said to me, actually put this in writing, he said, we are sick of graduating students who have no prayer life. Uh, they're not servants in their life. There's no servanthood being developed. Uh, they can't do anything, but they've got their degree. They've got their piece of paper. They're in theoretically qualified. We are sick of doing this. Wow. We need to build leaders for India. Number of students. How many do they have in the Bible school? School. Do you remember Tutti or Paulina or Robert? Do you remember how many students they have? It's several hundred. Uh, so it's not a small operation. Uh, in all of their training work, they train about 14 or 1500 per year. That's in the Bible school, plus they've got a number of non formal, uh, eight, eight different training programs in various parts, usually integrated with, the, uh, always, I'm sure, integrated with the church planting work. Uh, that use our models, of course, but, but that's a very easy fit, you know, in a non-formal, in the context of church planting. They, they began doing that immediately, uh, using our models in the non-formal, incorporating it. So many hoops to jump through in the formal education to make a major change like this. And we saw in the non-formal training, um, it dramatically improved the effectiveness of the church planting work. So back to the formal. First training we did, or I think several trainings with the board. Uh, the board and like their most senior faculty. They had about, how many faculty did they have? 30? More or less? More or less? Uh, so we had, we had the board, we had the whole board uh, in these trainings and, and some of the senior faculty and we just worked with them on a shift of thinking that they would be unified. Uh, Alex is a real team builder. Um, you know, he wanted everybody to be on board and he, and he recognized the need for that, you know, strategically um, in kind of an older sort of an institution like this. So we worked on that and they came on board. Then we worked with the faculty and we did how many over a two year period? We did, was it six or six? So we did six trainings. Uh, with the faculty, with all of the faculty, so 30 some, they're all, you know, PhDs and things, all these heavy uh, scholarly types, interviewed the participants, I'm sure they shared with the participants, a lot of interaction. Um, so, so we're giving them, I'm, I'm feeding them tons of stuff, you know, I'm having a lot of discussions with them, I'll go down and just spend a day or two just talking with Alex, Jason and Jesse about what this could be, what this might be, uh, that sort of thing. We're just exploring the whole thing of what can this look like? How can theological education be deeply life transformational? Uh, that was their vision. Um, and our vision too, of course. And to me, uh, the solution is very simple. Well, just stop being a theological institution. And <laughs> don't worry about giving degrees anymore. You know, if you don't have to give degrees, you don't have to be accredited. If you don't have to be accredited, that saves you so much. 
so much work and mucking around. It's unreal, the, the hoops you have to jo go through. So for me, it's very straightforward, but they didn't see it that way, and that's cool. I respected that. And so we, we came alongside them. Remember, it's their agenda, not ours, right? We want to serve them to fulfill their vision. Yeah, and that's their vision. And from the beginning and still to this day, they wanted to have deeply transformational, but also very strong scholarly academic focus. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm for that then. If that's what you want to do. I, I really love these guys. They're just really dear friends, fantastic people. And uh, they're heavy duty scholars, very high capacity. They're recognized uh, internationally as scholars. Um, but they are men and women of God, very deeply so. Uh, humble, the humility, the servanthood, really powerful. If, you know, when you meet them, I, I hope you all will. Uh, well, Paulina, you have, and Tutti, and um, uh, you, know, you wouldn't think these are heavy-duty scholars. You know, they just carry themselves with humility and grace and very, very precious friends. So we're doing all of this, and then they, they were in the process of creating a new course, and a, a new master's program, Masters in uh, Childhood Development. And so they created a brand new program, and they did it through the lenses of 5C4D. All right. So this was, uh, I believe, uh, th there may have been some other seminaries that had done it before, but I think this was the first major accredited degree program that was built from the ground up using 5C4D in our history. So for us, that was really cool. Not something I ever thought would ever happen, I'll be honest, but when it did, I thought, that's really, that's really great. So they developed this thing from the ground up. ATA, Asia Theological Association. Um, now the Asians will know, very familiar with who ATA is. This is the foremost evangelical <coughs> accrediting agency in Asia. So they accredit all of the seminaries and Bible schools. So they're the ones that the Bible schools have to keep happy. ATA did uh, then all of the rigmarole to qualify this new master's program, right? to be able to give an accredited degree. You know, you have to, it has to be approved. So ATA studied the program, went out, did the site visit, all of this stuff. A little while later, I uh, happened to be in the same city as the head of ATA India. And we uh, actually had <laughs> met uh, some years before when he was at HBI, uh, Paul Cornelius. And so we, we just sort of essentially bumped into each other, uh, so to speak. Um, and he told me personally, he said, that program, he said, that is the best design I have ever seen of all of the, you know, and, and that's all these guys do, you know, is they go hundreds of sem you know, seminaries and Bible schools and they check them out and, you know, study their stuff. And he said, that's the best design program that I've ever seen. See, crediting agencies, of course they want to see life transformation. Um, so, so Paul told me that he had encouraged Jason and Jesse, make it your highest priority to change all of your degree programs to be like this, which they then, of course, they wanted to do that anyway. And here's this uh, added, um, you know, encouragement uh, from the accrediting agency. So they set themselves to do that. Uh, we did some more design work. I think the design work Robert was talking about with them. Uh, and then the faculty, was it all of the faculty or just a few of the faculty or many? Three quarters. Three quarters of the faculty <laughs> took the summer off. And I mean they took it off instead of the holiday. So instead of going on summer holiday, summer vacation, they worked on redesigning all of their degree programs one after another through the lenses of 5C4D to make them deeply transformational, all of them. Uh, I remember when they showed me the first, uh, set, it was like this thick, you know, um, a complete set of all of their degree programs that I looked through. I mean, 5C4D is absolutely explicit. It is right, it is the framework, it is the, I mean, it's got an introduction by me to the whole, you know, to the whole, they asked me to write an intro to it, and, and, and it's, it's just, it's all of these models, it, it's just woven through with very heavy, strong academic. You know, they've got the 
20-page bibliographies and, the, you know, and all, the, all the scholarly stuff. But they've woven the life transformational things uh, uh, just beautifully through it. R really lovely way. They recast every degree program through the lenses of the five C's. Um, so what's our goal in this program? Our goal is no longer that you understand some information. You know, the traditional goal of a uh, academic program. You know, the goal is always you understand this, you know that, you, you know, you can explain such and such, you know. Those are always the goals. Uh, instead, now they're recast through the lenses of the 5C that there will be life transformation in, in one of these areas. And that's why we're doing the course. And then for each of the courses, they created four dynamic uh, opportunities systematically for each of the courses. A tremendous amount of work. So they uh, reframed the courses according to 5Cs. They then built 4D uh, grids, uh, very deep. I did a lot of work on this, quite extensive for each of the courses. So that way, when someone is leading the course, they have this beautiful uh, collection of four dynamic interactions uh, that they can do um, with the, the students. Um, in addition to that, they built the context at the seminary. They started uh, making a lot of changes to just the nature of the seminary. Um, yeah, I wish I could... Uh, Paulina or Tudi, do you, do you, or Robert, do you remember any of the specifics here that they did? Storm groups, women's storm groups, changed the way that they did their meals so that they were meeting in groups where they could share. And, uh, and they sort of hooked them up with uh, uh, local churches that had to do some sort of active yep. practice Serving in the local churches. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember any more, Tudy? Or Paulina, do you remember any specific? Um, they Each of them have mentors. I'm sure they have intercessors, or, or, all of these sorts of. Do you remember anything, Paulina? <coughs> yep. So they're. So they've got a team in the dorm and they're building them 5C, 4D uh, outside of the classroom setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ministry practice over the weekend. Yeah, tons of stuff. I, I've, I've been in meetings with, with seminary deans. The room like this will be full of seminary deans. And Jesse is telling them and she just talks for hours about this. She just talks about all the stuff that they're doing now, totally separate from the... Um, you know, the classroom stuff uh, to build life. Really fantastic. And the deans are like, wow, <laughs> you know, just, and, and it works. And, and their testimony is that it, it made a huge difference in the quality of their graduates. Um, and they also, they, um, yeah, I'm not up to date on this, but I know they were exploring as well in how to modify the evaluation uh, of the students. So it's not just purely an academic um, but they were incorporating a 5C evaluation as well into the, uh, the degree uh, evaluation. So really cool work. I remember one of the early changes they made, and this was back in the early days when we were just teaching them the principles. You know, we went quite deep into many principles. And one of the principles of leader development is that leaders who build leaders are themselves involved in leadership work and responsibilities. Yeah? So it's not just you're a professional teacher of leaders, but you need to be leading. When you are leading people and you're building leaders, changes everything. Because then it's not just some nice little theory. You know, it's reality. You, you're, you know the complexity and the hardship uh, of leadership. And so it changes everything for you. So they instituted this. In fact, they required this out of all of their faculty. They required them that they had to have their hands on actual ministry work. Not all the faculty wanted to do this. They lost some of their faculty who quit. Uh, one of their faculty had a really cool experience. So he was out one weekend in um, church planting in the villages, uh, working with the church planters. They had never done this before. You know, the, 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 the faculty were, you know, career uh, scholars, you know. You know, you go through seminary, you come out, you start teaching. Um, they'd never done this. Uh, one of them is out on the front line in the villages preaching the gospel 
The police arrive. He gets arrested. He gets put in jail. It was fantastic. <laughs> he came, you imagine, he was only there for, I don't know, a few days or something or other. Can you imagine the difference that that made to his teaching ministry? There it is, my goodness. So this sort of thing, you know, this is sort of what they went through. I'm very serious about this, you know. It wasn't just we embrace this as a nice intellectual ideas about a framework and let's add a course on 5C4D or something, you know. But they did it. They did it deeply. And, and very brilliant people, very creative people, hardworking. I mean, they systematically at, at quite a deep level, they have done this. Really extraordinary. I'm just watching this. You know, I'm in regular communication. I'm visiting them uh, fairly frequently. And I'm just like, I'm just in awe of the commitment that they made to this. So I'm encouraging them and ideas and all this sort of stuff. And so it just continues to, to move along. Um, so they take the summer off. They redesign everything. Uh, all of their courses now, according to a transformational framework. Um, and it is uh, now, I think the last one I saw was like the fourth edition that they keep revising it, you know, improving it. It's how many? It's up to five now. Okay, fifth edition. We're up to edition five. Um, and then God began to open doors for them to impact other seminaries and Bible schools. So ATA is so thrilled with the work that they're doing. Jesse, this is a few years ago, Jesse now starts heading off to other countries, training seminary leaders about what they've done. You know, she writes a book or two about this. Uh, journal, you know, their journal, all this sort of stuff. Um, I mean, it's being promoted in a scholarly language to the scholars. This whole thing, they want to share it. They've got a vision. Alex, top leader, he has a vision to change theological education in India. From the beginning, he had this vision. Uh, and so these models gave them the path along which to run. Um, so once they had the models, they were able just to do it. You know, it's very straightforward. They were no longer having to figure out uh, what does this even mean and how do you do it. They had a very clear path of action. You know, the models don't do the work for you, but they do give you a very clear path. But you still got to do it, and that's hard work, but it's a whole lot easier than having to figure it all out from the ground up. So, so now they're, they're going to literally even other countries. Uh, I'm hearing about them through other scholar friends in other countries um, who don't even necessarily know that we're connected to it. I'm hearing about this fantastic uh, pioneering work in transformational <laughs> theological education. Isn't that slick? Um, so then what happened, and, and this was at ATA's initiation, the accrediting agency is opening the doors and creating all these opportunities. So then Alex says, hey, let's all work together. ATA... NIBS and leader source. And so and since that time, we've been in a three-way partnership. So we've done a number of trainings where um, uh, ATA will call the event, invite everybody, and then leader source and NIBS, Jason or Jesse or Alex, actually do the, do the training of deans. So we'll have rooms of deans. Uh, ATA had their annual general meeting of an accrediting agency. This is the annual general meeting of an accrediting agency. Can you imagine such an event? Yeah. I mean, sounds like deadly, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, so it was going to usually have one day events. They made this one uh, a day and a half event, and they invited me to come and gave me the entire first day Whoa. to address all of the seminary deans from all across India, it was more than 100. It wasn't all the deans in India, but it was the main ones that they work with. Uh, all the big, all the big, all the, you know, the, all the, you know, you'll know all, you know, most of them. Um, yeah, so I had, I had these guys for a day. <laughs> they had never done that before. No, they had never done this before. Yeah. The plenary thing only had like an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah, yep. Day. Yep, and, and then the rest was just business. Um, uh, you know, that's normally what they would do. Just have a quick plenary and then we get into the business stuff. So they gave us the entire first day. 
Uh, so the way I designed that, I did the first uh, before lunch and I gave afternoon to Jesse. So what I did, I taught John 1.1. Nice. Ha ha, what else would you do when you have a room full of seminary deans? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> taught John 1.1 1, 1, and then out of that a vision for life, de- life transformation, <laughs> union with Christ, building of the whole life, quick intro to 5C and 4D. And then uh, Jesse brilliantly spoke after lunch in the afternoon and shared about their vision, what they're doing, all that sort of thing. It was really quite, it was quite, it was quite dramatic. Uh, we heard very good responses out of that. After that then beca- uh, began the three-way partnership between ATA, Leader Source, and uh, NIBS. That was really cool. So let's dive into some of the basic principles. And we're not going to go through the course but just uh, a few sections of it. Have a look, please, on page 58. Page 58, halfway down. Theological truth is never, repeat, never, presented in Scripture as a disembodied list of pieces of theoretical information that one is required to believe merely for its own sake. Theological truth in the Scripture is always connected to life. It always has relevant, practical, transformational purpose. That is the core vision of this model of transformational theology. You know, decades ago, uh, remember I I was spending hours and hours in the Word, studying the Word, reading the Word, just love the Word in my Christian life, just just to know God and know His Word. And I would also, I would read other books, I'd read systematic theologies, um, this sort of thing, and and I just found it an extraordinary disconnect. I didn't know what to make of it, I didn't know how to how to understand it, you know. But I read the Bible and it was just so practical. It was just real life. It was so deep, so, so profound. And, and then I'd look at systematic theologies, which apparently had high level of credibility and apparently this is the official way that we're supposed to go, you know, because I don't know. I'm just a young believer. But I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't connect the two. It just seemed so totally different that... The Bible is not written as a systematic theology, is it? And by systematic theology, I mean chapter 1 will be, what will chapter 1 be? Doctrine of God. And so we've got, you know, aspects of the doctrine of God and we've got the proof texts and arguments and the historical errors and da-da-da. Chapter 2 will be, what, Christology. Uh, Doctrine of Christ, person of Jesus, work of Jesus, fully God, fully man, two natures, one person, eternal sonship, you know, et cetera, et cetera, soteriology, numerology. And it's just these list of like these subjects, you know, and and then they drill into these subjects. And I I saw the value in these things because there is the clear articulation of truth and the prevention of error and so forth and so on. But it was just nothing like the scripture at all. Paul never did that. Paul never said, now let me give you, uh, you know, the theories about this doctrine. It was always woven into a living context. And a key, key point was, in the Bible, when the teachers and the writers teach something, their goal is never that you understand it. Never, ever, ever. This is shocking. I'm not saying their goal is that you misunderstand it, but their goal is never just that you understand it. But I left that word out first, leader, for the shock value. It wasn't a mistake. Their goal is never that you understand it. Their goal is that it changes your life. Of course, that includes understanding. Of course, accuracy of knowledge. But their goal is far higher than accurate knowledge. Their goal is always life transformation. Now, this is a stunning, shocking reality. Every doctrinal passage 
that you go to. You know, and by doctrinal passage, I mean the proof text passages where let's teach the doctrine of Christ. Here are our proof texts, you know, that prove the deity of Christ. Let's teach justification by faith alone. Here are the proof texts we use. That's what I mean. The classic proof text passages. Look at every single one of those with no exception. Read the context. Understand the goal of the writer. The writer's goal is always life transformation. The writer's goal is never limited to understanding of accurate uh, information about the doctrine. There is no exception to that, guys. It, there is not a single instance in the entire Bible where the goal is accurate knowledge. Not one. Let me show you what I mean. Look at Philippians 2, please. Philippians chapter 2. I think that there are so many examples of this that you can give, but I think Philippians 2 is a seriously spectacular one. Philippians 2, and you know the passage well. Uh, let's see, 5. In your relationships, one another have the same mindset as Christ who, being God, didn't grasp at equality, seven, made himself nothing, emptied himself, nature of a servant, human likeness as a man, humbled, death, death of the cross, yeah? Uh, which doctrine would one be teaching and then pull this in as a proof text? There are several. Humanity of Christ, incarnation, it's primarily the incarnation here, isn't it? Also, uh, the kenosis, the fact that he emptied himself. Yeah, those are the doctrines, right? So let's just use incarnation. So this is the, uh, there is theological doctrine here, isn't there? Incarnation. This is probably one of the first texts you'll go to in a systematic theology in the, sub, in the, the, uh, the uh, section on the Incarnation. Um, but what was Paul's point? Did Paul bring that up because his goal was that you would understand the theory of the Incarnation. Why did he write these words? That we would have the same mind. That we would do the same thing he did. That is put the needs and interests of others before ourselves, just like Jesus did. His goal is servanthood, humility, preferring one another in the body. His goal is life change. Do you understand? So what's the doctrine? Incarnation of Christ. What's the purpose? Life transformation, specifically Servanthood. Yeah, servanthood. It's servanthood here. It's amazing. Do you understand what I mean by distinguishing knowledge about the doctrine with the life change? Do you understand what I'm saying? Let's look at another one. Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. You can look at any doctrinal passage, by the way. And, and, uh, and, and in this course on transformational theology, there are exercises that make you do that. Go through a bunch of them. So we're just picking a few. Look at Hebrews 4, 14. Since we have a great high priest who's ascended into heaven, Jesus, let us hold firmly to the faith. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize, but he's been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence to receive mercy and find grace. What's the doctrine? Priesthood of Christ is one. What else? There's a big one here. Very important. The humanity. Of, uh, and of course also the sinlessness of the Lord Jesus. But the primary one is His humanity. The real humanity. Right? He was tempted in all points just as we are, yet without sin. Um, we do not have a high priest who, who cannot empathize. He's been through it himself, right? Real humanity. Genuine humanity. Jesus was human. Spirit, soul, mind, and body. Fully man. 
He was fully man, fully God. Two natures, one person. That's the doctrine. Yeah. So the, the doctrine is the genuine humanity of the Lord Jesus. But what is his purpose in writing these words? Is his purpose that you will get a good grade on your test on the doctrine of the humanity of Christ? That you'll have a solid theoretical understanding of this doctrine? Is that his purpose? Not at all. Of course, he doesn't want you to be in error. And if you are in error, then you're going to find yourself blasted like John does in 1 John. Yeah? Where he blasts those who are in error on the humanity of Christ. So it's not that, it's not that accuracy is unimportant to the writers of the Bible or to me. It's not at all. But, but that's not the goal. Actually, that's a means to the goal. What is the goal here in Hebrews 4? Why does he write this? To encourage us to turn to him because, because see, it, it's not just, well, God loves you, but, you know, wow, he's infinite, unapproachable. You know, uh, Jesus is man. He's fully man. He's lived just like you did. He's, he's been through what you're going through now. He knows it. He empathizes with you. Therefore, when you're struggling in a time of suffering, you can approach him with boldness. He's writing to suffering Hebrew believers here. Yeah, this is the whole book. They're being persecuted. Some are backing off from their faith. And he's saying, no, don't back off. Instead, go to God. Go to the Son of God. He's real man. He will listen to you. He cares about you. He feels what you're going through. Wasn't that fantastic? What a brilliant reality, hey? And that's his purpose. And see, his purpose is not the doctrine. His purpose is the life change. And he brings in the doctrine in that context to help him achieve his purpose. But the purpose is not the doctrine. The doctrine is a means to an end, not the goal. Do you understand? This is the core vision of the transformational theology model. That doctrine theology, theological doctrine, with no exception. Think about Thessalonians. Uh, what's the general theme of Thessalonians doctrinally? There's a, there are lots, of course, but the big one. <clears throat> Second coming of Christ. Yeah, tribulation's coming, man of sin, da-da-da, the return of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, that's the big one. Eschatology, right? So... Uh, uh, Paul is writing to suffering Thessalonians. They're being persecuted for their faith, a fierce persecution. And what's his point? Why does he write those letters? Why does he bring in the second coming of Christ? Why? Give them hope. To give them hope so that they will endure. Yeah. So they endure. That's the meaning of it. See, it's not that he's trying to start an argument about is the rapture pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. <laughs> that's not at all what he's doing he's not trying to you know now of course he talks about doctrinal things but the purpose is that we will endure suffering because Jesus is coming soon wow you, do you see that's the meaning of it that's the goal always every time see when you get that now go back and look at all the proof texts for any doctrine, with no exception. Always, with no exception. There is never a single time in the Bible where the writer says, now here's what I want you to believe about this doctrine. Period. Do you understand what I'm saying? Always, there is deep life transformation as the goal. Always, always, always. And do you recognize how in theological instruction, in theological education, we have so gotten away from that? That accurate knowledge is the goal. Do you understand? And where did we get that from in the beginning? We got it from the Greeks. The Greeks were the ones who are passionate for knowledge. So, transformational theology, first of all, reframes the goal. 
In traditional theological education, what's the goal? Accurate intellectual knowledge. Write the paper, pass the test, and I'm not saying have inaccurate knowledge. Of course. I love doctrinal truth. What do you think the second change is going to be? <laughs> you got it. Process. What's the process of traditional theological education? And specifically, what does it look like? Lectures. Lectures. Research. Teaching. Teaching. Research. Write papers. Exams, grades, class yeah. On Thursday at 1 PM. Class on Thursday at 1 p.m. in room 204 to study, you know, topic 602 for an hour. Yeah. What's the goal? What's the biblical? I'm sorry. What's the biblical process? See, we've changed the goal from accurate information to life transformation, what do we change the process to? Of course, we're going to change it to four dynamics. It's going to be a transformational process, yeah? Uh, here's a profound idea that I think most of you will know, but in case some of you don't, I'm just going to repeat it, so bear with me if you know this already. The goal determines the process. Everyone know that? Is that new to anybody? The goal determines the process. This is so important. The goal determines the process. If your goal is academic, what should your process be? Academic. It should be books and papers and lectures and research and da 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 da. It should be. That's, that's the right one. Yeah? That's the right process for that goal. But if if, if Intellectual knowledge is not your goal. Instead, life transformation, including a renewed mind, of course, by the way, but is the building of the whole person, then you have to change the process. Yeah? Because the goal determines the process. A transformational goal requires a transformational process. Now, here's the problem. For so many seminaries, they, in theory, have changed the goal. You go to any seminary anywhere in the world these days and you ask them, what's your vision statement? It will be things like, we want to build you know, men and women of character and servant leaders <laughs> and you know, it, it'll be all this stuff, yeah? But then you look at the process, ta-da, do you see the problem? So you've changed the goal, but just because you say you want to build servant leaders, you're not until you change the process. You're not building life. You're not building servanthood. You're not building men and women who know God. You're still just building men and women who can pass tests and write papers and get good grades, yeah? You change the goal. You must change the process. That simple idea is a big idea. And this is why many seminaries wonder. They wonder. But we really do want to you know, build men and women of character and capacity. Look, it's right there in our vision statement. And we added a course on servant leadership. This is what they do. Yeah, do you understand? We want to build men and women who are servant leaders. So we add a course on servant leadership. Academic. And so we study servant leadership. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, once, uh, some years ago, I met with a seminary leader in and I said so what's the goal what's the vision of your seminary and he said we well, have three-part vision our vision is to build let me see uh, deep theological uh, you know um, capacity character and practical ministry capacity and I said great that sounds holistic and I said so how do you go about building character I think it's really good it's a great vision how do you go about building character? How actually do you do that? Do you know what he said? You know what he said. We have a course on character. Do you see? See, they've embraced a holistic goal, but not a holistic process. We have a course on character. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with the course on character, except that it doesn't build any. Courses on character don't build character. In fact, courses on character can do damage. Because now you've done the course on character, you've studied the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic words for character, you've studied the results of character, the results of not character, whatever else you do in a course on character, and then you get an A on your course on character, yeah? But you're still addicted to internet pornography. That didn't touch it, the course on character, yeah? Just because you've done a course on character doesn't mean you have any. It's true. And in fact, sometimes it can hurt you because you think, well, I got an A on the course in character, therefore, I can't be too bad, can I? Well, you might be. It doesn't mean your life has been touched. Do you understand? We have to have a transformational process to achieve a transformational goal. So this is the second part of the vision of... Um, uh, Transformational theology. Here, um, let's see. What can we look at here? Yeah, look here on page 28. We're just going to skip through the manual here and there and pull out a few high points. That, that's all we're going to do with this manual. Do read it later. Uh, it's a good process. Uh, go through it. Do, do the exercises in it. Uh, you'll find it quite helpful. Uh, it's quite successful. Uh, but probably most of the time you guys will be doing courses like BHL, Healthy Church, um, you know, Generational Succession, other stuff, Knowing God, I mean, all, all sorts of things. You, you may not end up doing this much, uh, so that's why we're just going to go through it fairly quickly and, and uh, hit the high points. My hope again is that on, in our national teams that God will give us some people with PhDs, because if you're going to work with seminaries, you have to have a PhD. You, you just have to, or they're not going to take you seriously. You know, years ago, God made me get the degree. I never would have. I dropped out of my bachelor's degree. Literally, I had one subject to go, and I dropped out because I got saved. I said, I don't need this stupid thing. <laughs> Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> Why do I need this for? It had no value to me. I just let it go. Literally, I had one subject to go. Uh, back in Australia years ago. And um, after a couple of years of that, my dad, who was an extremely stable man, came down, not, not a believer, uh, came down to my little bedroom down the bottom and he yelled at me. And he, he could not bear the thought that I had come all this way. <laughs> and, and he was a highly educated man too, so he could not bear the thought that I didn't have a single degree. And, uh, and so he, he said, you will go back to university. You will finish that bachelor's degree. And I said, yep. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> I did. And then some years later, God kind of made me do the master's and then he made me do the, the doctorate. Uh, and I'm glad he did because, because I could never have done what I did in India without it. You know, so I'm not a fan. I didn't learn anything in, in doing the PhD except for, except, I'm not kidding. It was the stuff. You know, people look at me and they think, oh, yeah, you learned all this in your, in your PhD. And it's like, nope. Was it, was it just you who didn't learn anything? Or was... Oh, I, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> who knows? I can't, I can't imagine anybody learn anything in that. Um, but I learned how to do research. That I did learn. I learned what constitutes good research. So that's useful, I suppose. Not that I ever do any, but anyway, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, yeah, but so it opens doors. And, and so, so, yeah, so my hope is that in some of our teams, or maybe in a region, we will have one or two people who are able to go into seminaries and Bible schools and do this work with them uh, to help them to, to find transformation. You know? so, so let's ask God to give us those people. We've been looking for several years, haven't we, in, in India for... Uh, for someone to, to bring on in, in that regard. Uh, so where are we? We're on um, page 28. Okay, so look at this. How does the Bible teach theology? So this, these are issues of process here, right? Look at Psalm 8. Uh, we won't look it up. I mean, you know all these passages. Someone read this earlier today when we had church this morning, didn't you? Yeah. So notice, he threw its reflection. David had insight into God as creator. It's not that he did a, a, a course. 
you know, on, on creation. Not against courses on creation. I'm just saying that David reflected. He looked at the stars. And, and this is what Jim does when he teaches creation. He gets you outside and you engage with the creation. It's not just some academic thing. It's, it's very transformational for people. Psalm 22. David learns about the, the faithfulness of God. It's a psalm about the faithfulness of God, yeah? So it's not, you know, attribute of God. Which attribute? It's Thursday morning, 10 o'clock, attributes of God, 201. This week we're going to look at the faithfulness of God. Do you understand? Because we're up to that. Last week we did the omnipotence. Next week we'll do the holiness. <laughs> this week is faithfulness. <laughs> David learned about the faithfulness of God through suffering, experiential dynamic, yeah? See the first one, reflection, spiritual dynamic. And, and there is theological growth is my point. You're learning a theological doctrine through spiritual dynamic, through uh, experiential dynamic. Leviticus, through obedience to God's laws, experiential dynamic. Israel learned holiness, sanctification, yeah? Not by... The course. Romans 1 to 8. Through here, of course, we have we have instruction, justification. Matthew 22 through a question. John 13. Jesus taught his disciples servanthood. How? Which dynamic? Oh, John 11. We have we have. This is Jesus teaching on the resurrection. How does he do it? He raises Lazarus from the dead. Wow. You think after that? And then he says, I am the resurrection. Whoa. You think they understood the resurrection from then on? Man. They knew the doctrine of the resurrection. Yeah. Not just some theory that we debate about somebody's finer point of in some Dr. So-and-so's argument about some Greek word. And, do you understand? Through a vision, Acts 10. Look at this, Peter's understanding of grace. You know, the vision, eat the unclean, this sort of thing. I mean, how profound was that for Peter? What was the doctrine? I, let's do it. <laughs> so it, the, the doctrine is the grace of God, that the grace of God is for the Gentile as well as the Jew. Yeah? Praise God. That's the grace. You know, not sitting in some, you know, classroom behind somebody's back of somebody's head, you know, hearing some boring theo theoretical lecture. Yeah? On and on. Look, Exodus 13. You remember the, the doctrine here? Look at this. What's the doctrine? Exodus 3, 14. What happened here? I am who I am. Eh, yeah, asher, eh, yeah. <laughs> That's his name. I am. It's the verb to be, first person singular. I am. Asher, what? I am. I am who I am. Wah! I just am. That's what. And did, did Moses then understand the self existence of God? Wah! Didn't even write a paper about it. Didn't even get a grade on it. <laughs> Acts 2. Do you think the early disciples understood the Holy Spirit? After this, the room is filled with rushing mighty wind and. <laughs> Hi. through the love of the brethren yeah John says here 1 John 4 it's through the love of the brethren we learn about God's love wow it's, it's, it's experiencing it when we love each other with self-giving love we learn about the love of God relational dynamic isn't that beautiful see these are all the process these are God's process for theological learning do you understand? This is God's process. It's for dynamic. So this course, it takes a while, but it, it just slowly leads you through this, reflecting on what is theological, uh, you know, what does theology mean, and what the goals, and what's the process. 
Now for the third, for the third part of, I'm going to change this a little bit and not so much focus on the design, but more focus on content. We've seen the need for a complete change of goal, yes? From what? To transformational goal. Always a transformational goal. And from now on, you may never say that your goal is that somebody understands something. You may never say your goal is that somebody understands our model. That's not your goal. What's your goal? Meaning, what does that mean practically? They're doing the model. They're being changed by the model. Yeah, that's your goal. So if, if you're teaching design, what's your goal? That they're doing design. That they're doing it. If they're not doing it, you've failed. Doesn't matter if they understand it. Yeah? That's your goal. Our goal is not to teach people about healthy church. Our goal is to do two things. What are they? Vision and capacity. Because when you put those two together, they will do it. That's your goal. They need the vision. See, it's not just the capacity. They have to have the vision too, because then there's the motivation to actually do it. But you can't have the vision without the capacity. Then you're motivated, but you don't know what to do. Is that cool? Always build both. Always nurture both. Yeah? So your goal is not understanding. Your goal is change. Robert. We are not a train to train organization. Amen. 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 So 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is not our main verse. Yeah. 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 Do you want to say more or is that it? Well, I'll read it. <laughs> <laughs> 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. It may appear to be that is what we are doing, yeah. but it is not at all what we are doing. Because when we when we approach it that we're teaching people to teach this model, yeah. we undermine the number one goal, which is to transform lives. Because people are satisfied that they know enough to teach it, yep. even if their life never changes. So what happens is that people go out to teach this model without life transformation, and the people that learning from them, see that their life's not transformed. And what we've done is we've immunized the church against the truth. You know how vaccines work, right? When you get a vaccine, you inject the small part of the disease so that the body resists the disease, the full infection when it comes. And when we teach this as a teach the trainer, train the trainer model, we inject a vaccine that makes it very difficult for them to really hear what we're doing and do what we're doing, which is to bring life transformation. Because they'll just say, oh, I've heard five C's, I've heard four D's. I understand it. I agree with it. Let's <laughs> yeah. roll that into our system. Yep. Let's yep. teach it as a course in our seminary system. And we thus successfully build the model. So we are not a train-the-trainer organization. Yep. This is not content. Yep. Good. Very well spoken. Yeah. Yeah. Our goal is not that they love. I mean, we want them to love. Of course we want them to understand the model. We want them to love the model. But if that's it, we've failed. They've got to do stuff in their own life and the lives of others. Uh, good. So we have to change the goal from academics to... Life transformation. Yeah, always. And always think, what is... Uh, you remember on the first day when we were here and I said, here are our goals. Remember I said, according to the five C's, here are our goals for this week. You know, have clear goals for everything you do. And they must be transformational goals. Your goal is not to cover content. Your goal is to achieve life change. That's it. In order to do that, we have to change the goal. From academic goal to what? Uh, process, academic process, to a transformational process. And what is the transformational process? The word of uh, the, um, yeah, four Ds. All right. So on this one, I want to talk about this one under the idea of content, you know, like curriculum, um, which essentially is design, but specifically the content. So what is the content 
of traditional theological education, what do they use for content? Books. By who? Scholarly books. Lots of them. Commentaries. Well, yeah, and not even that. Abstract, obscure, theoretical, philosophical books. Yeah, that's all the stuff, isn't it? Books upon books upon books upon books. Yeah, Dr. So-and-so commentating about Dr. Somebody else's ideas about Dr. Someone else's three-part theory. That's, that's what we study, yeah? What do you think we need to shift to? Word of God. That's it. That's it, Word of God. And you'll notice in my courses and in my books, you will now and very rarely you'll see a reference to somebody's book. What do you see a lot of? That's it. That is totally intentional on my part. Uh, these are not scholarly books. Scholars won't like them. They'll not, well, they may or may not like them, but they won't be impressed by them, I meant to say. They won't be impressed. Won't think, wow, it's a really heavy scholarly book. I couldn't care less because we're writing for those on the front line who are doing the work, yeah? We're not trying to impress somebody or, you know, be known as a scholar, not in the slightest. So we must shift to the Word of God. That's the content of proper uh, theological education, yeah? The Word of God. And a little idea here, and then we'll have a, a break. Yeah, we will have a break. So on page... Uh, 68. Have a look on page 68. I just want to point you to, to, a, to a, uh, a simple principle here, the power of the Word of God. Page 68. The Word I've spoken to a spirit in their life. The Word of God is living and active. Christ loved the church. Make a holy with the washing of water through the Word. The Word of God is powerful. The Word is alive. The Word is alive. The Scriptures are not only a source of accurate and reliable information. They themselves have the power to transform lives. When we're in the Word, the Word is in us, our lives are changed. Books that are written about the Word are certainly useful, especially as they point us to the Word and help us to understand the Word. But they do not have the same direct power as the Word of God. They have considerably less power. Books that are written about books that are written about the Word have even less power. It's like a... Uh, let's see. Let's see if I could draw this on a... On like... Here's the Word of God. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this. All right. So up here we have uh, power. Okay. This is high power. I'm going to do this totally backwards. But anyway... This is high power. So the direct Word of God has high power, yeah? When you get away from the Word, so this is, this is one degree away from the Word. But it has, what's the word? Exponentially less power. It just kind of goes like this. The amount of power. Do you understand what I'm trying to do here? It's total, this is a total mess. But <laughs> now, if, now if we do a book about a book that's about the Word, burp. Now, if we do books about books about books about the Word, like nothing, man. I mean, it's, I mean, it's probably nothing about when you get like one or two, actually. But do you understand the point I'm trying to make? Just let's get rid of that awful diagram. But, but that's the point. Um, you, you, we, messages from a very powerful man of God, a woman of God, and then Lennon started saying me, you know, uh, you are eating somebody's food, you know, you have to directly receive from God, you know, don't yeah. eat others' food, you know, so he started saying me that, and then I started realizing stopped, and then I started focusing on the word of Amen. God, same like that. Amen, amen, yeah, yeah. Yep. Amen. Yeah, this is true for my books, everybody else's books. I mean, they're useful at a certain you know, level, but only as they point us to the Word. Be in the Word. Then your life will be changed. And, and when we do design of learning, let's use the Word. Not somebody's theory about somebody else's theory about someone else's book, but the Word. Use the Word. The Word is alive. 
That's the content. That's the third paradigm shift in the vision of transformational theology. What are the three paradigm shifts? Number one, goal must be transformational goal as opposed to yeah mere accurate knowledge of course we must have accurate knowledge but mere accurate knowledge unacceptable second paradigm shift from academic process to which means Four dynamic process. Yeah, beautiful. We see this all through the scripture. Again, look at where scriptures are taught, uh, where doctrines are taught in the scripture. You'll see four dynamics, just like we looked at the various examples of it. And what's the third paradigm shift? From books to the Bible. Yeah, amen, amen. From scholars to the scripture. What else? Do we also say scripture, but really encountering God in the scriptures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's possible for the for the, the scriptures just to become another book yeah. or almost like a blank check that we can kind of take out our own ideas. Yeah. So it's it's got to be when when we would do the small group studies and in, in the connections trainings, almost every time the kids would put their heads together and they'd spend 2 minutes praying and only had 5 minutes to do the study, but they would pray. Mm. So I I really That's great. think that if we make the Bible just another book, yeah, yeah. so we've got to see that it's the Word of God. Yeah. We've got to see Amen. that the Holy Spirit wants to illuminate to us. Amen. So we've got to have a right approach to the Word Amen. of God, which of course. brings us to your book, yep. Yep. Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. Good. Good.